start. Right. Just a gigantla hell, ya kindir, me veo mini mug, him dalla. El quilt, el quilt, senior, and not to me. The regular market is so thinning of the city on the city. At the hours, if I also knew her so in phone at the fold. Marlock man would give it off a marathon to him, a likeness and a medal never. Brand of brandy, Brennan, Punin, Air, Finny Cricket, the Puna, Margaret of Money, Brett of Margaret, the Empress, the Alaska of Dool. Flame is quickened by flame. A man from another man may become wiser, but from from of mutinous uh, but uh, from ignorance may remain conceited. Gods of our peoples and lands, may we spend this time together in friendship with you and with each other and use it to the common good, profit and pleasure. Forgive me uh, for speaking of what first comes to mind that Flanders has, for me, always stood in an exalted position as the origin of some of the greatest art and music that Europe has produced. The celestial sound worlds of Joscan de Pre, Johannes Ockergum and Orlando de Lassus and their counterparts in the purity and power of some of the earliest, earliest oil paintings ever produced anywhere, um, namely those of Jan van Eyck, Roger van der Weyden and Hans Memling. The style of these works was indigenous, though the references were ultimately Jewish. The Jesus and Mary in the altarpieces were depicted as if the people were from Flanders. Speaking personally, if I could, by a process of Interpretatio Germanica, render these masterpieces not only generically meaningful, but more specifically and theologically so, I, I would gladly do that and thereby connect more intimately with our inheritance. Because here in Northern Europe, uh, we don't have our own monuments from the time when we worshipped according to an indigenous revelation which they do so richly in southern Europe. Religion I think should be the expression of the best, the most holy and the strongest in the identity of a people. For northern European paganism that uh, you know th th there are two problems with that. The first is that I think the, the best, most holy and strongest over the last a thousand years has been almost entirely Christian and that our own tradition um, is present today only in traces that suggest what was here once but no longer is. And secondly, that as with all the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity is more or less an exclusivist faith and it's theologically therefore more or less incompatible with any acknowledgement of divinity. And um, while Interpretatio Germanica works more or less adequately with um, uh, other pagan pantheons, it might not uh, be able to do so between a pagan pantheon and an exclusivist monotheism. However, such an approach might be possible and lead to a, a fruitful stimulus in relation to another Indo-European pantheon, if one might call it that, namely that of Hinduism, whose, uh, whose scriptural resources dwarf those of Christianity, the Mahabharata uh, being, you know, just to name one uh, text, uh, being almost three times as long as the Bible. But maybe more important than that is that it is alive. Hinduism is a living faith, and for an old candle to burn again, it may need a living flame to reignite it. And uh, finally, furthermore, it offers a model for uh, a model of a unity of different traditions some of which are almost entirely one ethnicity, yet at the same time entirely Hindu, entirely pagan, if one were so to use the word. And with that, um, I very warmly invite uh, Dr. Els to unmute and uh, uh, speak. Right. So, good evening, all of you. Uh, to uh, introduce myself, so I'm an uh, Orientalist. I study 
Asian languages and cultures and religions. But um, I had a certain interest in pagan religion already earlier. Uh, since my uh, about 20, I worked in a new age bookshop. And so there were all kinds of <laughs> interesting people coming there. And I got to know all kinds of traditions. And um, so I wasn't really a member of anything, but I knew all those people in my area who were involved in this astrology, pyramid power, ley lines, all the rest of it. And uh, I, I was sort of a hippie and um, I've been to the sacred places in Southern England several times, Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> slept on the tour, you know, heard the uh, the heart of the buried uh, Merlin beating. <laughs> and uh, somebody explained there in Glastonbury that on the Zodiac map, you know, of which the city of uh, Glastonbury is a mirror image, he was living right in the armpit of Sagittarius. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was a, you know, a jolly scene, really. But I mean, I, uh, you know, I enjoyed that, but I also kept my distance from it. I had my own business in life. Um, it is only after I discovered India. And so this is at uh, my um, 29 years. That's when I first went to India. Very soon I met uh, um, Sitaram Goel and Ram Swarup. You, uh, you get to see him in the PowerPoint. And so that's where, um, where in fact I was thrown back on uh, European paganism. You see, he advised me, you see, get involved with this movement because he has, has specifically recommended Westerners to, you know, what he called make a pilgrimage through time to the religion of your ancestors. And um, so while things were happening around me, I did get involved. So in, in um, 1993, in the nearby city of Antwerp, a uh, neo-pagan association was launched. So I joined it from the beginning onwards. Uh, though there were a few problems with it, and they're rather typical of the whole neo-pagan scene in the whole West. Um, first of all, the name Tradisi, as the name of the association, tradition, uh, is a bit well tainted um, because this referred in the mind of the founder uh, to something that he held very dear, namely traditionalism, the movement of uh, um, René Guénon, uh, who became a Muslim. And his whole idea of traditionalism was very close to the, the revelation religions. You see, the idea in traditionalism is that at one point there was a revelation and then nothing can improve after that. That's the highest thing you can aspire to. So you have to preserve, you know, that origin. Uh, I, you know, I thought that that was a bit of a, a different current from what paganism really stands for. Um, then uh, secondly, and, <laughs> and I feel here in this circle, I really have to, walk on eggs, you know, to, to address this, but uh, there was politics. You see, the founder was the son of an East Front volunteer in the Second World War. And quite a few people who were members were like that. And so I immediately uh, protested against that, at least if they, you know, I mean, people can think anything they want. But you see, as soon as they mix it in with the uh, hoped for religious program of this association, 
that I thought was very problematic. Um, because, you know, look at it from the viewpoint of our ancestors. Um, you know, I mean, you have few written sources among the Germanic people, but for instance, among the Romans, you see that the, um, the Republican party versus the Imperial party, the upper class versus the lower class and so on, you had all kinds of different opinions from people who were worshiping the same gods. And so, you see, I thought this, this identification with a specific political current was a, was a mistake and, and would be a, a fatal uh, constraint on the flowering of this movement henceforth. Now, finally, maybe I did have a little bit of influence there because I did, um, I did convince the founder to this, uh, um, effect that he did, you know, announce publicly that, you know, we should keep the politics out, upon which a number of members actually ceased coming. Because for them, this was elementary. Now, you see, I, I don't like offending those people at the same time. I think for the well being of the movement, this was a correct position. And indeed, the future has borne this out. Um, like in the 90s, for example, I wrote in the association's paper a piece on the swastika. And I said, look, you see, of course, the swastika is an ancient history among the Native Americans, among the Trojans and the Greeks, among the Baltic people, uh, and then, of course, India. And um, so there's nothing wrong with it. And I explained what this means and so on. And um, I added, you know, that, well, you know, if, if, if at all you fancy reviving this, then you should make it clear that this is not the same thing as the Nazi swastika. Now, some people objected to that. And so that, that for me was really problematic. You know, I, I thought that what I'd said was really evident. Um, but so the biological fact has sort of taken care of that. You see, either those people have left, as I just explained, or that generation has died off. The present generation is simply not interested in that heritage anymore. And so, you see, the, the this association after a minor time has really gone back to flourishing and attracting many new people. And, and um, related chapters have been opened in other parts of the country which incidentally is also a typically pagan phenomenon, just like you see in India. You know, you have Sampradaya, that is religious sects. And so they're very local. Uh, they depend, you know, in quality upon, you know, what the individuals are who take the leadership, uh, you know, what local influences there are and so on. So even in an extremely small country like Belgium, you know, the chapter in the west and the east of the country are already different from the one in Antwerp. Um, and so, uh, let's say that these heady ideas like traditionalism um, are not so important anymore. And so there's a lot more connection with what you have of elements of living paganism that have survived or that are within living memory. Now, typically for Flanders, unlike Scandinavia, uh, it has practically no uh, heritage from the pagan period. It was uh, Christianized quite early, fifth century. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you heard about the conversion of King Clovis, who was from what is now the city of Tournai and then he relocated to Paris. Uh, but so in order to win a battle, he converted to the religion of his wife and he won the battle. So you see, then he started promoting Christianity. Similar story with Charlemagne later on. And so, uh, you know, we have nothing like the Edda and so on. And so the, the, the national feeling of national heritage is very linked to Christianity more than in most countries. 
Um, and so the artistic glories that you mentioned of Jan van Eyck and the, um, the contrapuntist uh, composers and so on, uh, that's all against the background of Christianity. And um, so uh, even in the 20th century, for instance, or in many European countries, there were already flourishing neo-pagan movements. Like for instance, Churchill was an ordained Druid. A few people know that. Uh, you know, in Belgium, there was nothing, which is very strange. Um, you see, much of the neo-pagan revival initially was not meant seriously. It was an interest, mostly interestingly of parish priests because they had leisure, they had education, they knew mm -hmm. Latin and so on. And so, you know, in their free time, they uh, looked into these ancient customs, uh, you know, where some customs uh, came from that appear in processions or other sort of Christian or Christianized uh, practices. Like my father, for example, was very much at home in the history of folklore, yet he was a very devout Catholic. And um, so that's the situation mm. like until after the Second World War. Mm. Um, then um, in England, perhaps it, it went a bit more over a long period. In Flanders, it went very abruptly from Christian to post-Christian. You see, I remember the time very well when I was 14, 15, I ceased going to church, I ceased believing. And uh, many people around me were like that. And typically it was the eldest son, the, you know, the adolescent son who rebelled and then gradually others followed, then mostly the parents also followed. And um, so you see this, this shift from Christianity to post-Christianity happen very fast. And so the, the, the mass of conformistic people who only went to church because everybody went to church, they suddenly started not going to church because nobody was going to church anymore. Mm -hmm. And so this, this went quite fast. And so the, 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 the cultural atmosphere is very different. But then you see all the, the, the study work and so on that had been done for studying what was called folklore suddenly became relevant, you see, became useful for a pagan revival again. And so that's what this association um, has, has mostly done. You know, it has given more shape, more direction to this uh, revival of pre-Christian religion. I mean, what post-Christians do is, many of them, of course, are, are lost. They look for the, what Salman Rushdie called the God-shaped hole, you know, <laughs> left by this de-Christianization. And so, you know, they take an interest in Oriental religions, or you see, there are often also very fanciful uh, novelties, but they also uh, start getting more and more serious about pre-Christian religions. In that respect, by the way, I am quite optimistic about the evolution. You see, just like for Indian and Chinese practices, I see an increase in quality. You see, they're better rooted, they know their stuff better and so on. The same thing happens in neo-paganism. You know, I mean, mm. in the beginning, it was all very, uh, you know, trial and error. But, you know, the rootedness, the knowledge of uh, the Edda and so on, that has become a lot better. And you see, in, in the case of uh, our country, um, what is quite remarkable is the rediscovery of all the pagan elements with a Christian overlay. And so in Protestantism, especially in Calvinism in Holland, that's much less because the Protestants actively fought this. But in Catholicism, lots of things have been, you know, accepted in order to make the religion more palatable to the old pagans so that they would convert faster and more easily. And so, like, for example, 
uh, my two sons have both walked in a procession some time ago uh, for the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. strictly speaking. But you see that the church in the city of Mechlin, uh, where this takes place, was originally a, a sanctuary, a sacred place for some local river goddess. And so, you know, this, so this is what we're doing. Um, okay, now where does Hinduism come into all this? For this, you see, I'm going to need a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. So here right. it is. Right. Now I've, uh, I've made you, made you co-host. So you should be able to screen share. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, then now you should see it. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Okay, now an entry point for this topic is mm. something you might have heard of. There exists an International Council for Cultural Studies founded by Hindus living in the United States. Um, especially Professor Yashwan Pathak, who uh, is a professor of pharmacy in some American university. And he's also an office bearer of the Hindu nationalist movement, mm. the RSS, Rastriya Swayam Sevak Sangha which means the National Volunteer Corps. So if I, people who are not familiar, forgive me. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Mind. People are not from, who are not familiar with the uh, RSS, it, it's, it's quite a, it's almost like a religious order that operates in secular life. And I see uh, this gentleman is a um, Charak, which as far as it, it's, He's a full-time worker for Sang, as far as I know. And yeah. I think people that take this office, they lead lives without marrying, and it's like a monastic order. They become San Yassis. You know, uh, uh, so it's, it, it, this is quite a serious organization, and, it's, and, it, and it has quite high ideals. Uh, it's yeah, but, yeah, but you see, <laughs> that's a different topic, so I'll spend only <laughs> one sentence on it. But I have a lot of criticism of the RSS, which precisely is too much a secular movement and a secularist movement in the Indian sense. Namely, they don't want to affirm themselves as Hindu. They say all kinds of nonsense that every Indian is a Hindu and that, you know, Hinduism needs Islam and, and so on. So, you know, they've, mm. they've, they've lost the way the last years. I mean, I hope they'll find it back. Yeah. But nevertheless, some of their individual members uh, take very good initiatives. And so this, mm. this, you know, international pagan platform, because that's what it is, that, that was really a stroke of genius. And so it started as a, a communication forum between Hinduism and every local uh, existing pagan tradition. So in Nigeria, you have Hindus with Yoruba people and so on. Yeah, a very active movement is in uh, New Zealand with the Maoris. And so they, so they started these bilateral dialogues with Mayas in Guatemala and uh, the uh, Yakuts in, in Yakutia and Kirgizia and so on. And uh, so then they, they started, you know, get, bringing it all together on one platform. Um, so they, uh, they get together in one Indian city every three years, but they do all the time local get togethers. And so one thing related to it, I don't know how officially related, but certainly you meet the same people there is uh, something that happens in England every year. I think it's called One Tree. Mm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bilateral meeting between Hindus living in the UK and uh, Druids. Um, so, and it is they in fact who organized this year's gathering, international gathering, because normally it's in an Indian city. 
but this year it was a teleconference. And so it was, you know, organized quite professionally, mainly by Hindu students in the UK. Um, so here they make their statement. Now, um, so, oh yeah, uh, one group I have to mention very specifically is the Yazidis. The two last gatherings have seen a lot of interest in the Yazidis who are probably a community originating in India. Uh, as you can see in a number of Hindu leftovers in their religion, um, but at any rate who have made headlines with their treatment by the Islamic State. Um, so anyway, uh, their platform though is I think not really doing justice to the actual contents of pagan traditions. You see, it's, uh, it's very uh, well sloppy liberal stuff. You know, the vision of the ICCS universal well-being. Yeah, of course, you know, who could be against that? Of course, we're all for universal well-being. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not, um, uh, well, it doesn't do justice to what really happened in, in pagan traditions. Uh, like, for example, about feminism. You see, the um, three years ago, there was a gathering in uh, Tane, Mumbai, in India. And um, really, the, the, the leadership of the whole event was uh, taken by a few women from, from America and from Latin America. And, um, well, they were just not representative as such for what uh, traditions have stood for. You see, I'm all for the emancipation of women. I'm a child of my time. Nevertheless, um, you should see that uh, many traditions that have preserved their tradition are not in that, uh, that mood at all. Mm. Like for instance, the Yazidism we mentioned. You see, in the Yazidis, that's a very traditional society, you have a very strict separation uh, between men and women, and a lot of constraints imposed on women. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm not telling them that they should change that or they should keep that, but I'm just saying, you know, that's just different from the mm -hmm. spirit that is uh, spread, uh, propagated by these American Hindus with an emphasis on American. Um, so that's a bit of a problem that, that can be worked out, of course, but I'm just signaling it. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, our mission is so to facilitate the revitalization of diverse ancient traditions. Again, that sounds good. You see, it becomes problematic once you start really doing it. Like for many traditions, like for instance, the Aztecs in Mexico are notorious for bringing human sacrifice. Or there is a city near here, or uh, not a city, I mean a place on the map, uh, not even a village, <laughs> a forest, where um, there um, have been uh, dug up um, corpses of people who were sacrificed. You know, they were all, and this is a, um, a soil where corpses are preserved very well. And so you see they were dug up and, um, you know, they were dressed up and tattooed and so on and really made ready for this ground occasion. Probably we don't know, probably they even felt proud of being chosen for the role of human sacrifice. But at any rate, they were sacrificed, dead. And so do you want to revive that or not? <laughs> you see, I, I think few people are inclined to do that, but strictly speaking, that's the question you have to address. And so with such uh, mm. mental exercises, also we have mm. um, for ourselves come to the conclusion, you know, a, a new religion starts where we are. Mm. And so maybe our ancestors were not against human sacrifice, but we are. Let's start from here. Mm. Mm.
Can, 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 yeah. Just uh, br very briefly into into. Yeah, yeah. I went. I, I went to see a, a, a very big exhibition about the uh, Aztecs at, at the Royal Academy when I was quite young here in uh, yeah. in London, and I I was very impressed by by the culture. And at the time, I I thought yes, in many ways. I, I I would have liked to have been at the time when I would have thought it was meaningful maybe to give up my life like that rather than merely just die with dementia as my father is now and it's it's a pretty sorry state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's it, it, you bring up an interesting point, but that's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, please go on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, that brings up for me the question of euthanasia. Mm. You see. In a number of countries, including Belgium, euthanasia has been legalized. And so people who feel too sick to, to continue with life, um, they choose death. And so they have a medically assisted exit. Um, it raises a few ethical questions. Like, for instance, some people are going to feel a bit pressured, you know, uh, I shouldn't be a burden on society or on my children so let's just leave which is in fact the attitude of our ancestors i mean there are very many stories like you know when a british expedition went to the south pole yeah with scott 1905 i think mm. you know when they went back you know they didn't have enough food supplies and so one of the men said okay you know and mm. he ran into the snowstorm and so that's what Captain, very many... uh, Ca Captain Oates was his name. And uh, yeah. I, I was at school when we were told those stories as an example of, yeah. of heroism. And I still think that's worthwhile. Well, you see, that's what very many mm. uh, ancient people did. And um, so in India right now, the situation is that um, it is the British who imposed the law against euthanasia in the 19th century. Uh, from a Christian background. You may have heard a bit more because it's more politically uh, vogueish at the moment about the law against homosexuality, which was also imposed. It didn't exist in India. So from a Christian viewpoint, they imposed mm -hmm. that. And so both laws have very recently been not officially abolished by parliament, but put in suspension by the Supreme Court. And so uh, in India, it is fairly common to choose your own death, not by killing yourself, but by fasting unto death. Mm. And so some of the people who did that were, because of this British law, actually troubled by the police, force fed and so on. And so uh, the giant community where this is most popular, they went to court to fight this and that they were, they won through. So right now, this form of euthanasia is, is legal in India, mm. uh, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, so Ram Swarup. Um, so he's the fellow who really, you know, made me um, take neo-paganism serious. Um, so he wrote books critiquing Christianity and Islam and he defended uh, polytheism, which is not a done thing in India. Mm. You see, people practice polytheism, but you know they have no specific idea of the anti-polytheist stance in Christianity and Islam. And so they, they treat Christianity and Islam like any of the many sects within Hinduism, which is a great mm. mistake. Mm. Um, Anyway, so Ram Swarup appealed to pagan revival. Um, and so in a way, and this is also acknowledged by uh, Patak, who founded these gatherings of the elders, um, uh, he was very influential on, on his initiative. Um, so, and he was a very soft person, you see. <laughs> if you talk about Islamophobia, as they do nowadays, it is laughable in the case of Ram Swarup. He was a very soft person, but nevertheless, he 
really was the um, the, the patron saint, so to speak, of uh, this international pagan revival. Right. So I guess some data here. Um, I sent instead. I sent the uh, this PowerPoint to you, so you can send it on to everyone attending. Great. So, Thanks. Thank you. So here are the data of my papers about it. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the last conference uh, said that, um, well, it defined paganism. First of all, this is a bit, again, a bit problematic. We'll bring together over 30 nature-based traditions. You know, nature nowadays connotes uh, environmentalism, which is, of course, a good thing in itself, but which is overdone at the moment, and which, um, wrongfully neglects other aspects of life. Um, then wisdom as old as humanity will be shared by elders, thinkers, earnest activists who act relentlessly to preserve what the ancient Hindus called Dharma, what the Druids called Avan. I'm looking to you to see if this is correct. Um, I think this is Welsh. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh... I'm not an expert in the Celtic language, but I thought Arwen was used to describe the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Okay, well. Um, oh, it means fl not, it's fl flow. But it's, isn't so it? Flow, it? It's connected to spirit, but it, it means flow throughout the world, not just throughout the body. It's, yeah. Okay. But okay. It's yes. flow. Is, is it, have you come across it being used as a, a translation of Dharma? No, no, I, I, no, and, and I, would, I would dispute it was as yeah. well. Yeah. So I think the Druids would like it to be. I think Dru I find Druidry trying to fit, you know, sort of square pegs into round holes to make mm -hmm. things fit with Hinduism, but that's mm -hmm. just my personal opinion. And I think that's one of the things they're trying to make it fit, but it's not like Dharma, no. Okay, thanks. Sorry. And the equation with unity underneath all our diversity. Again, that's a dangerous thing to say. In India, that's, that expression is used precisely by people who want to legitimize Christianity and Islam. You know, to okay. say, oh, you Hindus can't be against this because you are for unity of all religions and, mm. you know, so you have to accept them. Well, problematic. Uh, about my own participation. So I, I spoke at this, uh, this gathering this year um so um increasingly as i explained we focus on really existing heathen lore rather than harking back to a book you know the edda that's quite interesting that's also an, a legitimate influence but it's not the most important you know in paganism there shouldn't be something like mm -hmm. like the taliban harking back to the book and you know the the, yeah. the companions yeah. of the prophet as the ideal um, then you see, initially, when it was set up, apart from traditionalism and René Guénon, it took as its model mostly the Scandinavian movement of Asatru, mm. being true to the gods. And so that, uh, that, that remains valid. But so the emphasis today is more on existing uh, practices. Um, and so you know, more and more, we see that what we do as a pagan movement is not some freakish, eccentric thing, uh, but it more and more ties in with a social evolution that is simply going on. Like, for instance, in, in Brussels now, most funerals are cremations. Practically all the burials that take place are Muslim. So you see, even what remains of Christians have often accepted the transition to pagan practices. Um, and so many people are trying to make sense of it all without Christianity. There may be still some religious feeling in them, but they think quite correctly that the dogmas that define Christianity can't be sustained. 
you know, you can still say a lot of nice things about Christianity, about their art, their music, their architecture, and even about their ethics. Part of it is okay. Uh, but nevertheless, no, Jesus was not resurrected. No, he did not deliver humanity from sin by his death and resurrection and so on. So the, the, the basic beliefs of Christianity, those can't hold. Similarly, in Islam, it is not true that Muhammad received a telephone message from Allah and that this is the Quran and so on. Um, so the basis of this religion is what is wrong with it, not the practices. Like, for instance, in, in Islam, you know, they, they practice fasting. Now, the way they organize their fasting, that comes in for criticism. The idea of, you know, stuffing yourself before you go to sleep when it's already dark, you know, that's bad. <laughs> that's not healthy. Then the fact that the fasting month in the Islamic calendar can happen any time of the year, that's also not good. You see, uh, doctors of uh, spas, you know, of, of health, you know, they advise fasting either at the end of winter when Christians do it or at the end of summer, but not any time of the year. You know, not in the hot summer in Saudi Arabia or not in the cold winter for the Pakistani immigrants in Scotland or so. No, no, you see, this should be at the right time of the year. And then these funny practices of not during the daytime, only after dark, that's, you know, that makes no sense. So there's some practical uh, objections to it, but the idea of fasting is of course perfectly okay, exists in most religions. And indeed, you see, Muhammad himself started with his revelations when he was on a fasting retreat during the fasting month, which originally fell exactly when the Christian land falls, you know, end of winter, mm -hmm. beginning of spring. Um, so, or, or the pilgrimage, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, that's a very pagan thing. On the one hand, Muslims say, yeah, God is everywhere. On the other hand, they go on <laughs> pilgrimage to that specific stone which was a, a meteoric stone. I mean, imagine that you lie in the field, tending your sheep, and then you suddenly see a stone falling from the sky. You know, you wouldn't know any better than this is a message from the gods. Mm. And of course, you build a temple around it and start worshiping it. So it's, <laughs> it's a very pagan thing, going on pilgrimage. So I have nothing against the Islamic pilgrimage. Um, so, you know, you should see the pagan elements even within so-called monotheistic religions. Um, so I see an overemphasis on the environmental problems. You know, this I've seen in several of these gatherings of the elders. You know, what I find problematic with it is, first of all, it's... Um, uh, oh, let's see here. Um, you know, they are commendable and necessary in itself, but they satisfy the Christian stereotype that paganism is a nature religion. You know, the word paganism mm -hmm. means from the countryside. People in the city, they lived where the preachers came, you know, in the demographic centers to spread their message, whereas in the countryside for centuries, people remained pagan. And so in the Christian view, Paganism is associated with primitive, with nature oriented and so on. And this care for the environment precisely confirms this. So, you know, it makes sense on the one hand, like it's true that paganism, paganism is oriented to nature in this sense that it isn't anything artificial. If you go live anywhere on earth, in the desert or in the forest or wherever, you have enough stuff to create a religion and you're going to worship the trees and you're going to worship the sun and so on. You don't need scripture to start a religion. So in a way that's pagan, okay. Nevertheless, for today, you see it's, it's, it's too Christian stereotypical. Then it's also too easy. You see nowadays, everybody is for the environment. You know, 40 years ago, you had green parties doing this, but now all parties claim that they're for the environment. And so, 
the opponents of nuclear energy say, oh, we are for the environment, whereas the defenders of nuclear energy say, oh, but you see, nuclear energy is in fact quite far cleaner, otherwise you will have to have gas uh, and so on energy. Mm -hmm. so, so that's better for the environment. So the, both sides of the argument say the same argument better for the environment. So that's when you know that a value is accepted by all society. Mm -hmm. So on that, I think paganism has little to add. So for example, this, the state of the family in Western mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. the only ones who have a specific answer to that are the evangelicals who simply want to go back. Who say, you know, the family as it was in the fifties or in the middle ages, that was good. Let's continue with that or go back to that. Maybe the answer is something else, but at any rate, you won't find the answer if you don't focus on it, which mm -hmm. so far, most places I see, pagans in, in Europe are not doing. Um, okay. So yeah, I hear more bibliography. Um, the fellow you see here uh, down below is um, Shrikant Talageri. He is a very important historian from India. And um, here you see him at the ceremony where he's granted a um, honorary doctorate. Um, so in India, there are a number of populations that the British called tribal. Mm. And so, yeah, they're in a way closer to nature. They don't worship in temples, they worship in the open air and so on. So, in a way, you could say, well, you know, they are more pagan, Hindus are not, but you know, how exactly you should see that relation is very well explained in the paper that I've mentioned here by Sri Kantalagiri. Um, so we'll come to that, or you know, you can ask questions about that. But now I'm first going to hurry through this subject. You see, um, all pagan religions have a few things in common, no matter how different they are geographically and in terms of stage of civilization. Um, the defining element of religion per se is, as the uh, religious sociologist uh, Emil Durkheim said, is all for the sacred. So that's really in common. Uh, I disagree with people who say, oh, Islam is not a religion, it's a political ideology. No, it is, of course, also a political ideology, but it does have all for the sacred. It does fill the God-shaped hole. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's typical for paganism. Not a specific creed. Ever since Christianity, we define a religion countable a religion by its creed. What do you believe in? So you see, mm -hmm. Hindus tell me that they always get that question from Westerners. And what is it that you people believe in? Yeah, yeah. And, and so they try to, to, to invent some things, uh, like, for instance, belief in reincarnation. Now, that is indeed something that most Hindus believe in, but that's not a defining trait of Hinduism. The Vedic seers did not believe in reincarnation. There is, in fact, a, a funeral ritual where the priest has to point in the sky the zone of uh, Scorpio Sagittarius and, and say that, you see, this is where the dead souls go. And um, so, you know, at that time, beliefs were different, but it was Hinduism. Um, and so, you know, no matter if everybody believes in it, it's not the definition of Hinduism. Hinduism simply is Indian paganism. You see, there's a geographical detail, namely India, but otherwise it's just paganism. All kinds of things happen in Hinduism. Um, and um, nevertheless, you see, all pagan religions worldwide have a certain soft corner for Hinduism because it survived on a large scale. Uh, whereas they themselves are all like fighting for survival or revival. Like for instance, in Latin America, after a few centuries of absolute Catholicism, 
uh, it, it transpires that just like in pagan Europe in the Middle Ages, a lot of the original religion has survived. And now in countries like Bolivia, you have a strong pagan revival, uh, which is uh, of course uh, commendable. Um, but so they all look up to India. In the case of Celtic and Germanic neo-paganisms, there is moreover something else, namely a closer kinship through Indo-European. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you should not make too much about common Indo-European heritage. There is nothing wrong with people outside the Indo-European world, but nevertheless, it is a factor of more kinship. Uh, this is the Indo-European language family, all the colored areas like the Germanic languages, the Romance languages and so on. And then the Indo-Iranian languages down there in blue. Um, so through this common language, a common heritage has filtered through a common thought pattern and common mythology. Um, you have a lot of common uh, poetic expressions that you find in um, in, in the Greek epics, in the Indian epics, and so on. The most famous one is the expression undying fame. Kleos and Gritom, which in Greek becomes Kleos Aftitom, and in Sanskrit, Shravas Akshitam, undying fame. You see, that's what poets were supposed to do. The king was being heroic, and the poets had to make sure that his heroism was cast in a form that was easily um, memorizable mm. and that became popular and so that his fame would live on. Mm -hmm. um, partly, I, I, obviously, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the two very famous uh, verses from um, Hobbemol, the Edda speaking about cattle and kindred, which, which exactly illustrates yeah. that notion of fame, li living eternally, yeah. Right. Then um, a very minor factor is the fact that there has been a transmission from India, you know, within the Indo-European world. Uh, you see, for instance, in, among the Greek philosophers, you have uh, acknowledgement of influences from India. This is most clear in the case of Pythagoras, who had a sort of ashram uh, like in India, with a lot of rules similar to the Jain sect in India, like strictly vegetarian, not only meat prohibited, but also certain vegetables, and uh, a rule of silence. If you become a member, you have to remain silent for five years, and so on. Um, then another element that you certainly know uh, that has come from India is the Bundestrup cauldron. Um, it was found in Denmark, Bundestrup. Uh, it was apparently, that's what they write, made in Bulgaria. Now this is, this is definitely Indian elements. So everybody knows uh, one of the scenes depicted on it, namely uh, Pashupati, or what is called by the Celtic people, Kernunos. Um, so this Kernu means the horned one, so it's the horned god. Um, now, the, um, the horns, well, um, in India, the god Shiva is always depicted with the lunar crescent on his head. He's called, you know, one of his epithets is Chandradhar, the moon bearer. And what does the moon bearer mean? Uh, yeah, and his sacred animal is the bull. And the bull, of course, has horns in the shape of the crescent moon. Aha. Now, this is a very universal thing. You know, you have the same, uh, the same thing in uh, Arabia where the, the god of the Kaaba, of the, the sacred place of Islam, before Islam, was called Hubal. Um, and so he was the, the, the moon god equally. Um, 
and he had three daughters, just as in the Vedas, Shiva is also mentioned with three women. Um, what are they? They are three phases of the moon, namely the beginning of the lunar cycle with a very thin crescent, the first appearance of the moon. Then it grows and you get the full moon and then it wanes again and you get the last moon, right? Those three phases are personified as the three daughters or the three wives or the three consorts or even the three mothers of this uh, horned god. You find the same thing among, I don't know how your <laughs> relations are with them, but there is another neo-pagan cult in Europe, the Wiccans. Mm -hmm. And so the Wiccans very much worship the horned god and the triple goddess, right? That's, so that's the same thing. Um, so that's the horn god. Okay. Now he is sitting in, you know, in between a number of animals. That's what in India they call Pashupati, the lord of the animals. So Shiva is often also depicted like that. Uh, there are in fact seals from the Harappan culture, uh, four or five thousand years old, where you see Shiva seated in lotus posture, surrounded by animals. Uh, yeah. May I tell you something? Th there are some quite similar depictions on uh, Gulhorn, the, the golden uh, horns mm. uh, from uh, Denmark. Okay. Uh, and uh, there was a scholar, not an archaeologist, um, but a very inspired person who wrote, uh, by the name uh, Gunnar Sneum, mm -hmm. uh, who, who wrote a very nice book explaining them and comparing them to traditions such as uh, the uh, old Indian tradition and also the Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he saw in them a, a, a kind of uh, initiation uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, many things uh, reminiscent of yogic reference. Right, exactly. And, and tantric. And there are also similar similar from Greek vases. Okay, and, uh, well, okay, we'll come to that. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's in my PowerPoint. You'll see. Uh, as yeah. for this Gundestrup cauldron, there is a second scene that has been given much less attention, but that's in fact even more clear. Um, you see, uh, right in front of you on the top side, which is the uh, the inside of the cauldron you see a depiction of, uh, again, a few animals at the bottom. Mm. Then you have a goddess in the middle and flanked on two sides by an elephant. And it's apparently here uh, sculpted by somebody who heard of ele elephants but didn't know them. Because you see, mm. the animals you see there are definitely nothing else than elephants. Nevertheless, they're not very true to type. You see, they are a bit too thin. Somebody who has actually seen elephants who made them bigger. Nevertheless, a goddess surrounded by two elephants sprinkling her, you know, that's a very well-known theme in Indian art as the goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of uh, opulence uh, surrounded by elephants. It's in India called Gaja Lakshmi. Um, yeah, and so there are no elephants in Bulgaria, let alone in Denmark, are there? Um, now something more deep, you know. Um, in um, we, uh, we may I just ask you something? This yes. Is about yes. I mean, uh, never un underestimate uh, underestimate the role, the mediating role between uh, the Persian Empire, Iran, and India, because these elephants. I mean, they were introduced into Europe through the Persian, yeah. uh, I mean, wars. And you can see that this very, I mean, very adversary attitude among the Western uh, pop culture, Western filmmakers that uh, uh, as soon as you introduce elephants into a war, like mm. in the, you know, Lord of Rings and so on, you become a bad guy. Uh -huh. You're out of business. So, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. or you have the, the elephants in the Punic War with the Romans. I mean, yeah. So, so, 
this, this, there you have some, some kind of, you know, very strong symbolics in just elephants. You introduce elephant in the war, you know, your war design and many things, new things happen. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Okay. So, Thank so you. Indian elephants, they were, they were, you know, they they, they found their way to the to Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. The Mom. war effort. Yes. Thank right. You. Okay. A common idea in the Indo-European world is uh, Indo-European three functionality. Uh, la mm. three functionality and the European mm. uh, term coined by George Dumézil in the mid 20th century. So he saw three different functions, first of all, in society, but you mm -hmm. can abstract them to a threesome that you find in Indian philosophy, namely what is in India called triguna, the three mm -hmm. qualities. So you have the priestly function, which is linked in, in the universe with heaven, uh, with above, and with the color white. This is the quality that in India they call satra, which means truthful or transparent. Mm -hmm. Then the martial function is linked with the atmospheric, uh, atmosphere, the sphere, uh, so the, the, the sky, I mean the sky closer to us where the wind and the, 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 the storm and so on takes place. So the, the heaven is crystalline, is static, except for it's, you know, turning around the earth or so it seems. Um, whereas the atmosphere is very dynamic if there are life forms in it and wind can come suddenly mm. and so on. Um, that's the martial function that's linked with the color red and with the, uh, the guna called rajas. Rajas really means the dust in the air. Like if you see you know, there's a hole in the roof and the sunlight comes through. You can see that there are all specks of dust dancing in the air. Uh, that's Rajas. Then um, you have a third function, the production function linked with the earth, with the direction downwards and with the color black, that which blocks the light so that it creates darkness. That's Tamas. Tamas means dark. Incidentally, just a, a fun fact, the word Tamas is uh, cognate with the English word Thames, the names of the river, which means oh, the wow. dark river. Um, so you have the same scheme in Rome, uh, in Scandinavia, like in the, um, in the Edda, there is a scene where there are three kids born, signifying the three functions. So one of them has white hair, one of them has red hair and one of them has black hair. Um, so it seems to me that the uh, symbol associated with Wodan, the Valknut, though we don't know what the, the Germans themselves really called it. The Valknut is a modern term, uh, which consists of three triangles. Hmm? And so these three triangles really show the dynamic of Triguna, namely, you have one above and one below. They signify heaven and earth, white and black. Mm. And then you have red, but you see the red triangle is on either side. It's either on the left or on the right. And if you want to <coughs> impute a movement to it, that triangle decides whether it moves clockwise or counterclockwise. Now that's precisely the function of Rajas, the dynamic martial function is to get things moving, all right? That's what it adds to the white, black or yin yang scheme. Um, mm -hmm. Now this, this, you know, this is extremely rich in symbolism. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I want to add to it now is that it is this that makes the difference between Christianity on the one hand and Judaism and Islam on the other. Judaism and Islam are really monotheistic. And they say about Christianity, oh, but you don't believe in one God, you believe in three. 
And then they bring out the Trinity, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, you see, this is in fact a, a very correct criticism. You see, that's a, a, a scheme coming from Hellenism, which was the sort of cultural milieu in which Christianity was created and which has influenced Christianity enormously. And so these three gunas, these three qualities are really the, the, the Trinity. And so you can see that <laughs> the, uh, the father God is the, is the Rajasic element. He's very choleric, as you know, he's very wrathful. Um, then uh, Jesus is the sattvic element, the truthful, the peaceful element. He's the prince of peace and so on. Um, and the production element is the Holy Ghost. He's, of course, invisible, uh, but he creates uh, multiplication. You know, first of all, it is he who is the father of Jesus. You know, mind you, the father is not the father of Jesus. If you read your gospel properly, you see that he's created by the Holy Ghost. Yes. <laughs> um, and moreover, uh, the Holy Ghost appears when the apostles start preaching. So when the believers in Jesus are being multiplied, right? So this element of propagation of quantity, you know, that's, that's represented by the Holy Spirit. That's our third quality, okay? So, um, there are a number of general similarities in the mythology, um, like, uh, and so these general themes are often woven into historical narratives. You should see that often this, you know, these, these overarching themes are older than the historical narrative, like the Trojan War, we know was a historical war in some, you know, 13th century BC. And so older themes are woven into this narrative. The same with the Kurukshetra war about 1500 BC in the Mahabharata, the Indian epic. Now, what, for example, are these common themes? The thunder god kills the dragon. You see, you have Indra killing Vrtra, you have Zeus killing Typhon. You have the son of Zeus, namely Heracles, who kills a sea monster uh, that is going to eat some woman that is being held out as a sacrifice. Then uh, Siegfried, who is the son of Donar, the thunder god, uh, kills the dragon. Uh, and you see in, in mythology, if one god is called the son of another god, it means that he has a lot in common, that he has essentially the same qualities. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you have in England the myth of uh, Beowulf killing Grendel. I guess you know all that. Um, so that's that's a pan Indo European and even beyond, like in Babylon, you have Marduk killing Tiamat. Um, then, uh, typically, Indo European myth is uh, the creation myth of um, Manu. Inya Manu sacrificing Yemo. Manu is, of course, the man, and Yemo means the twin. That's where Gemini in Latin comes from, or Yama in Sanskrit. Um, so he kills his twin brother, and then he uses the parts of the corpse of his brother to make the parts of the universe. Like his skull becomes the heavenly vault and his feet becomes the earth's surface, and his blood becomes the rivers, and his bone becomes the mountains, and his eyes become the sun and the moon, and you know, like that. It's a very common myth that you find throughout in the European world. Um, like Ymir. Yeah, right. So Ymir, the same way, is divided up and, you know, makes up the universe again. In, in Rome, myths are often euhemerized, that is to say, turned into a history or a legendary history. And so the city of Rome, the foundation of the city of Rome becomes a little model of the creation of the world. 
with the twin brothers Romulus and Remus, mm. of which Romulus uh, kills Remus and um, then creates the city. Um, so I know uh, similarly, you see, this is a myth that you also find in a Chinese version and in a Maya version. So it's, it's a very old thing that's spread across the world. Um, you have a nice myth of the thunder god masking himself. You see, the gods and particularly the thunder god have the power to take any shape they want. And so there are many stories about this created by poets that should not be taken too seriously as myths, but that are just suggested by this, you know, funny um, starting point. So if they can take any shape, you know, in, in, in human terms, they will use that shape in order to gain certain advantages. So Indra impersonates the sage Gautama in order to seduce the latter's wife, um, Ahalya. So Ahalya is very faithful. She only wants to make love with her husband, but the man who walks in has the shape of her husband, but it is Indra, aha. Um, Zeus, of course, you know, goes through this story many times in order to seduce all kinds of women. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, he becomes a bull in order to abduct Europa. Uh, Siegfried impersonates his friend Gunther in order to seduce Gunther's wife, uh, Brunhild. Uh, it's like literally the same story as, as said of Indra. Um, now in India, this is later elevated philosophically into the doctrine of Maya, the idea that the world is an illusion created by the divine. Um, linked to this is another myth about the thunder god. You see, the thunder god is masculine par excellence. You know, it's, it's the male function par excellence to do everything that the thunder god does, to flare up, you know, to become angry, but to become, to be powerful, you know, to exercise his power. But you see, because this is so emphasized, it also becomes the butt of jokes. And so his masculinity is also getting questioned by the poets. And so, for instance, uh, uh, the donar at some point loses his hammer, which is the like embodiment of his power. And so he has to gain it back by dressing up as a woman. Hmm? Odysseus at one point goes on a spy mission to find out what the secret of the strength of the Trojans is. He has to penetrate the wall, but the walls created by Poseidon um, are magical and they cannot be penetrated by warriors. So he has to dress up as a woman. Uh -huh. um, now Indra, I just told you that he seduces the wife of the sage, but you see sages have the power to throw curses. And so Gautama curses the masculinity of Indra. And there are different versions of what happens then to Indra. The, 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 the best one I think is, you know, he is cursed to be covered in a thousand vaginas. And so pop, pop, pop all over his country, vaginas spring up wet holes and then you see indra goes to brahma and he says now look you know i look ridiculous is there nothing you can do about this and brahma says well no you see the curse of a brahmin you know you you know you're powerless against this uh, but what i can do is to hide these holes i'll put, put an eye in each of them so instead of Indra with a thousand vaginas, he becomes Indra with a thousand eyes, which is of course an image that is already much older than this story. Because, because of the starry sky, you have this image of the divine having a thousand eyes. So that image already existed, but then you see uh, a poet wanted to be funny and use this as an explanation. Anyway, um, another common myth 
the near invulnerability. Uh, in the Mahabharata, you have a woman called Gandhari, um, who, you know, in preparation of the war that is going to happen, she wants to protect her son. Now, she has a blind husband, and in order not to be superior to him, because a woman is supposed to be subservient, she puts on a blindfold. And so all her life, she hasn't seen anything. But because of this, you see, her look has become very powerful. And so now she has the power, just by looking at her son, to make him invulnerable. So she agrees with her son, okay, this afternoon we're going to do this. But meanwhile, you see, Duryodhana uh, discusses this with Krishna, and Krishna says, but you can't do this, to stand naked in front of your mother. That's bad manners, you should wear a loincloth. So he does, but you see, that makes him vulnerable. He doesn't become invulnerable in the places covered by the loincloth, and that's where he later gets killed. Same thing happens with Balder. He extracts a promise from all the plants, you see, uh, and except the mistletoe, and so it's the mistletoe that kills him. Um, Siegfried bathes in the blood of the dragon that he has slain, but a leaf falls on his shoulder, so there he remains vulnerable and he gets killed. Achilles is put in a magic potion by his mother, but she holds him by the heel and in the heel he remains vulnerable and gets killed. And finally, Krishna, back to the Mahabharata, um, he, um, he gets a paste from a sage, Durvasa, um, which uh, he has to apply to his body to become invulnerable. He does so except for the same thing as heal, and there effectively he gets shot. Um, so all of them get killed through the remaining loophole. So this is very clearly a common theme. It's not obvious. I mean, there are many people who know thousands of stories and never have heard this one. So it's a, it's a very specific story. And so if it happens in many different mythologies, it signifies a common origin. Um, now, a very interesting one. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I really would like to go speak in Oxford. Um, he was a scholar from Oxford. He died last year. Um, and so he wrote an article when I saw the title, I really, you know, I traveled in order to go to a library when they had it. I absolutely wanted to see it. Uh, the Indo-European Roots of Yoga. Aha. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that paper, he, he argues that uh, two scenes from the Mahabharata and from the Odyssea are very similar, stage by stage, and he lists 23 events that are parallel. <clears throat> and um, so he notes that even though parallel, there is also a difference. <clears throat> Namely, the journey that Arjuna in the Mahabharata makes is a yogic project. <clears throat> and there are yogic elements in it, whereas this is not the case in the journey of Ulysses. So, <clears throat> for example, both heroes have to prove themselves against a god which is all, a god very similar also, a god with a trident. Shiva holds a trident in India, Poseidon holds a trident in Greece. And they're both gods of the underworld. And so for the Greeks who lived on the sea, the underworld below them was the sea. Whereas in India, which is landlocked, is the earth. But so it's essentially the same idea. And later you also find it in the devil, in Christianity. He's also the underworld and he also has a trident. Anyway, <clears throat> so Arjuna tries to impress Shiva by his ascetic exercises, which are yogic exercises, including some yogic practices like the tree pose. You see, he has to stand mm -hmm. for, I think, 40 days in the tree pose, uh, which you see depicted here. Um, 
Whereas uh, Odysseus, he has to defend himself against Poseidon. You see, there you have a very human challenge thrown by Poseidon because Poseidon is angry. Namely, because Odysseus has blinded Poseidon's son Polyphemus, who has this third eye here, with only one eye. We'll come to that also. But so he's been blinded and Poseidon is angry with him. And so he tries to throw all kinds of obstacles in his way home. Um, so Nick Allen reasons, okay. So we have the same story, but it comes in a yogic and a non-yogic version. Clearly they are from the same origin, but there are two possibilities. Either it was a non-yogic story, as in the Greek version, and the Indians have added that to it, but that's unlikely. You see, many people say, yeah, you see, they invaded India and then they took over the culture from the natives. Yeah, but in that case, they would also have taken over the stories that explain this culture. So if yoga was new to them, they would not have used Indo-European stories to explain yoga there would be new stories. So the alternative is the original journey was a yogic journey like in the Sanskrit version. And in the epic version, this has been lost because through the rough and tumble of the migration all the way to Greece, well, it was not stable enough for a complicated practice like yoga. Mm -hmm. So Alan says, I shall argue for the second scenario claiming both that the proto-narrative shared certain features with yoga and that the telling of such a story makes it likely that there already existed what he uh, cautiously calls ritual practices ancestral to yoga as we know it. <clears throat> then um, I'll bring together the mythological and the yogic elements in a final case study. That's the end of it. Um, in the Vedic pantheon, there are how many gods? Anyone knows? Um, well, you can see here that there's 33. Mm. That's already the answer. But in many tourist guidebooks say there are 330 uh, million gods. Yeah, 3 yeah. million. Yeah, it's yeah. a million, isn't it? Yeah. That's simply a mistaken translation. So <laughs> in the Vedas, it is said that there are 33 great gods, Koti. And so later on, oh, really? when they created words to designate the different large numbers, billion, trillion, and so on, Koti was chosen with the value 10 million. And so 33 Koti came to be interpreted as 330 million. But in fact, it just means 33. Okay. These 33 are heaven and earth. Then there are 12 heavenly gods or Adityas, 11 atmospheric gods or Rudras, and eight earth gods or Vasus. You see, eight is a very earthy number, like a cube has eight angles. 12 is a very heavenly number, like the zodiac. Uh, 11, now 11, that's a strange number, and that's precisely fit for the atmosphere. The atmosphere is unpredictable. The wind can rise and, and go down and, you know, do all kinds of strange things. So 11 signifies the atmosphere. Those are the Rudras. <clears throat> Here are the 12 Adityas. And so the 11 Rudras. Now, this is very hard to find a depiction of the Rudras, but this is one that I did find. Uh, in the Upanishads, which are philosophical additions to the Vedas, uh, these 11 are explained as the 11 winds or pranas or life breaths. Anyway, so among them, you have Indra, whom we already saw, the thunder god, who's very related to Rudra. Uh, you have Vayu. In Dutch, you have a word called Vayan, which means to blow. The wind is blowing, the wind vayt. That's Vayu. Then you have the word vata. Vata is related to the Germanic word wind. Uh, it's also related to the Dutch um, and German word wooden, 
which means to rage like the storm. It's also related to the god name Woden and also to the Latin word Vates, which means an inspired poet, which is also one of the domains of Woden. Um, so let's first um, say something about the thunder gods. There are two of them in a sense. Uh, so you have Indra, which really literally means the rainer. He exists also in Hittite mythology, although there he would become a woman. Uh, so that's the same deity as Zeus, as Jupiter, as Donar. Um, he is, you know, he has as a symbol the elephant, which later becomes, you see, Indra disappears from sight. He's not worshipped in modern India, mm -hmm. but he's replaced by someone else who's also an elephant, namely Ganesha. And he's seen as the son of Shiva. There are stories about how he's the son of mm -hmm. Shiva, which again means that Indra and Shiva are very related deities. Now, Indra means the good storm. You see, in India, uh, in, in May, June, it's extremely hot. And then you see when the rain comes, this is around summer solstice, the rainy season starts. And so it always starts with, you know, clouds gathering and then a storm, thunder and so on. And then it starts to rain, big, you know, drops of water, hot water. And so people run out to expose themselves to the rain, happy that finally, you know, the, the heat is coming to an end. Um, <clears throat> that's Indra. You see, that's, that's the God that everybody expects everything from, you know. Whereas Shiva is the storm in the mountains. There the storm is dangerous and unpredictable. If you go for a walk in the mountains, the locals will tell you, oh, watch out. You know, in 10 minutes, the weather can change completely. Uh, that's Shiva. So Shiva is a bit dangerous. Rudra or Shiva. The real name is Rudra, meaning the crier, the shouter. Um, but he's named Shiva in an apotropaic sense, warding off the danger that he constitutes. You know, it is like Stalin or Aurangzeb in India. There is much of literature praising them. And so some stupid uh, commentators might say, oh, see how popular he was. No, no, <laughs> he was praised precisely because he was dangerous. You risked your life if you fail to praise him sufficiently. Uh, so Shiva means the good one. Like you have an expression in Sanskrit, Shivam, uh, Satyam Shivam Sundaram, meaning the good, the, the, no, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Um, so Shiva or Rudra is also the primeval yogi. Here you see him in a Harappan seal, 2,500 years old, uh, 4,500. Um, a famous hymn in India that everybody knows is the Murtyun Jaya mantra, which means the victory over death. That's also devoted mm -hmm. to Shiva. Mm -hmm. So here he is called the Triambakam, mm -hmm. which either means the three-eyed one, that's how they usually interpret it. But literally, it can also be analyzed as the three-mothered one, the one with the three mothers. So that's the, the triple goddess that I explained before. Um, so, well, again, I mean, that's him. Uh, so he's also the master of... Um, of growth and, and decay and so of death. So the victory over death, that's addressed to him. Um, now he's very similar to Woden. Uh, you know, Woden already is depicted as somber and cold, just like Shiva in the mountains. That's also why Shiva and his consort Parvati, which means from the mountains, are depicted as white because the snow you know, the mountains. Um, he's surrounded by animals, Pashupati, 
Mm. Um, in this case, by two wolves and two ravens. He's depicted with a spear that's not exactly a trident, but that's the same heritage. Mm. Um, in the Romans likened him to Mercury being the mystery man, the god of riddles and of poetry. And so the name is cognate with Vates. Vates, a name which you all know from another word, namely Vatican. Vaticanus Collis means the poet's hill. So he's always depicted with a trident. You find it also in Poseidon, in the devil. I think originally it is a reference to the same Triguna worldview, where you have three poles. So you have unity, the stick below, and then you have the world. So the consciousness is only one. That's the stick below. Whereas nature has these three qualities. Uh, all things that you can imagine, that you can see, are always partly tamasic, partly rajasic, partly mm -hmm. uh, sattvic in different uh, proportions. Rudra is accompanied by a host of young warriors, mm -hmm. uh, just as Woden is. You know, the wild horde in the case of Woden mm -hmm. is the Maruts in the Vedas. Um, about the wild horde, you may know that uh, they appear in the dark season, November, December, when the dead are supposed to return. Now, in, in, a, in a reincarnationist interpretation, these are the children. Children are, like, by definition, the dead who return. Um, and so uh, uh, a privilege uh, during rituals among the ancient Germans of those who impersonated the wild horde was that they had a right to steal. They could knock on your door, come in, and take something. And so this lives on in the custom of trick or treat. So either they're going to do something to you or you have to give them something. Mm -hmm. In the low countries, I don't know if, 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 if at all you people, to what extent you are aware of this, but so in the low countries, uh, we have a saint called Sinterklaas, in French, Saint Nicolas, so that's, that's really the, the Christian saying, Nicolas. Um, and um, it's celebrated on 5, 6 December, together with his companions, the Black Peats. Now this has become very controversial uh, because um, you see in Holland, which has a history of slavery, colonial slavery, not Belgium, but Holland does. Um, somebody has decided that this you know, black beads signify the black slaves. Because after all, they are the servants of the white Sinterklaas. Now this Sinterklaas saint is very much Woden, like he rides through the sky, just like Woden mm -hmm. does. Um, and he has this staff, which is of course the spear of Woden and so on. Um, but so these black peats are the Maruts and they have nothing to do with colonial slavery. I mean, <laughs> colonial slavery, that's very recent. Here you see, we talk about the Vedas like 4,000 years old and it was not just Europe Europeans. I mean, it was Persians, Indians, you know, they all had it. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's an element very close to home very much alive in popular culture um, that, that lives on and that really carries a pagan heritage. Mm. All right. Oh yeah, two more things. Um, so Woden um, rides through the sky and he has this Valknut, the knot of the fallen that he depicted here, uh, which I think is an expression of the three functional uh, worldview. Oh yeah, and then finally, uh, the third eye, you see. Um, 
in in the Odyssea, Polyphemus is mocked because of his third eye. Now there it is said that he has one eye mm. because in the rough and tumble of the migration to the West, they lost the real yogic meaning of the concept of third eye. But this theme of third eye lived on for stories. And so he's being mocked and then his eye is poked out. Uh, but in the case of Woden, this, this so-called one eye, which is a third eye, is explained as the result of sacrificing one eye for wisdom. So at least the association with wisdom is still there. Um, I am told, I don't know anything about Celtic mythology, that in the case of Kukulin, uh, there is also a story of him being one eye. Then among the Greeks, there is uh, Zeus uh, Talmus, Zeus with the three eyes. All right. Um, so, uh, okay. yeah, and so, Sorry. so this Poseidon, as I explained already, he's the father of Polyphemus. So Polyphemus one-eyed means Poseidon essentially, in some respect, also one-eyed, just like Woden. So you have the same, mm -hmm. the same character based on this uh, Rudra. Um, another uh, similarity is that Homer mm. is called blind, which is very unlikely for someone who has written all this poetry. And the same thing is said of the Vedic seer Dirghatamas. Again, mm. very mm. unlikely mm. because he has poetry about the starry sky, which is hard to observe if you're blind. So clearly this means something else, namely that if you close mm. your eyes, you can meditate. Mm. So it has again this yogic, uh, yogic connotation. Mm. Um, oh yeah, and Woden acquires knowledge by hanging in a tree for nine nights. Now that's again one of the oldest yogic exercises, the bat pose, hanging upside down from the branches of a tree. Mm -hmm. mm. Also in Vedic meter, a very important meter, the Gayatri meter, which is three times eight, you find the same regularity in the runic alphabet, which clearly was inserted there on purpose. Uh, this makes me think of something, another similarity. Um, in Hindu mythology, a very important number is 432,000, which also appears in the Babylonian king lists, but which also appears in the description of the Valhalla, which has, how many was it? Uh, uh, 540 mm -hmm. gates, each of them guarded by 800 something warriors. At any rate, the product of the two is 432,000, right? So anyway, so you see people who are proud and that initially in, in my first years in this neo-pagan movement in Belgium, I saw regularly that people are too proud to accept anything coming from elsewhere. Yeah. They think that our ancestors were ethnocentric. Now, of course, there was not the same kind of communication then as now. They couldn't take an internet course in Sanskrit. Um, so yes, their horizon was a lot smaller, but I don't think that they had a, an objection against anything foreign. Like you see, for instance, in the, the Interpretatio Romana, where the gods in the different pantheons were like translated into one another. Uh, so, you know, I think at this point in time, there should be no objection to learning from, I'm not saying borrowing from, but learning from traditions that come from, among other places, India. Mm. So that's more or less what I uh, wanted to say tonight. Oh yeah, this is London, the last time I was there. This is at the uh, front gate of the um, SOAS. SOAS, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Center of uh, Oriental and African Studies. And so this poet uh, 
in front of whose uh, statue I'm sitting is uh, Tiru Valuvar, the, uh, the venerable weaver, who is the oldest uh, Tamil poet some 2,200 years ago. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, uh, Dr. Els, thanks so much for bringing together uh, a very wide range of facts from different directions and uh, uh, producing a very, very cogent and uh, stimulating conjunction, which, which I found very convincing. And lots of the, the uh, associations you, you've drawn, I, I, I've not encountered before. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, many, many very, very good ideas. And uh, it's very kind of you to have sent me the presentation because I'd like to look at that again, and I'm sure many other people would. Uh, uh, and I hope, I hope that um, we, we, we will have some, some uh, questions from, from our quite wide range of, uh, of people. I think it was Michael who, <laughs> oh, no, no, Frank, Frank has, has, has got an auto automated hand. Uh, do, do, does anyone have to go quick, uh, uh, immediately? I think, I think Michael's got his hand up, so Michael, fire away, sir. Uh, un unmute, please, Mark. Mark. That's okay, all right. Uh, Karen, I, I really enjoyed your talk, and especially the first half. Second half, when you get into the Indo-European thing, that's a lot more controversial, and would love to discuss that with you sometime. I, I remember I came to, I think you organized the WCER, in, we had in Antwerp, and yeah, and I've always been curious, and I was so impressed with your with the uh, the ceremonies that that you guys put on in Belgium, and always thought, well, why don't the Dutch have anything comparable? Uh, you kind of explained that uh, tonight by talking about the Protestant bias in, in the Netherlands vis-a-vis -vis the Catholic, and so thank you for that. Uh, on the pol political thing, I remember we got stuck at one ritual that we had outside of Antwerp. And a very delightful couple, just and what they weren't even going back to Antwerp, but they did for us. But what was kind of upsetting was that they were uh, militant uh, Flemish, and the Walloons were just were totally being put down. And um, so we had to just remain polite and, and go along with that talk. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a, a number of, of, of questions, but just curiously, who would you identify then as these three wives or daughters or uh, consorts of Shiva? Uh, you, you, which goddesses do you have in mind there? Because that, that was curious for me. Yeah, well, um, the idea is, first of all, that you see this, this triplicity is, is something universal. Wherever you turn, you run into this. Um, so, you see, the secret of the universe is not oneness, maybe something above the universe might be, as the Jews and the Muslims say, but the universe itself, you know, there you find triplicities all over, everywhere you look. And so, all these triplicities are, in fact, uh, personified by these goddesses. Uh, in the case of Arabia, they are um, Alat, Al Manat, and Al Uzza. Yeah which correspond to the sun, uh, the lunar phases, not the moon itself, and um, the, the planet Venus. Um, I, the weekends, I think what they make of it is the, the first stage of a woman's life, then motherhood, and then crone, you know, the older woman. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then there are the three names in the Vedas, Gungu, Sinivasa, and um, Raka. But those goddesses disappear with the Vedas. They are there in the Vedas, and then afterwards, they're never heard from again. But then you get uh, new triplets of goddesses, like um, Parvati, the white one, the sattvic one. Then Durga, the, the combative one, the red right. one. And then Kali the black one. All right, okay. Um, I'll, I'll go with that. I mean, that, that could be debated too. And 
uh, the one thing about, and of course, I go with your uh, triplicity, but at the same time, if you read Littleton's um, expose of Dumasil, and he was a Dumasilian supporter, but if you really read him carefully, what, what it comes down to is more of a, of a duality than a, a triplicity. Uh, that's that's a whole mm -hmm. other argument. But mm -hmm. I just want to question the, the Valk note, or however you pronounce that. I've read uh, somewhere not too long ago that that's basically a recent um, development. It's not an ancient one. And I just question using that symbol as something that goes back to the past. I've heard that it isn't an ancient symbol. It's on one of the uh, Gotland stones quite prominently, Michael. So. Yes, yes, I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, right. comrade. Sorry, comrade. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, about this uh, archaeology, I know very little. I'm a, <laughs> I'm um, a city dweller. <laughs> But it, it's it was on the um, it's on the same stone that um, uh, the the depiction of um, Lord Odin taking the form of the eagle with the with Gunlas with with the horn mm -hmm. and uh, Sutton with the knife behind that, that I had on the last bloke talking about the the myth of, of winning the the mead and it's on the same stone I think on the other yeah, side I, I can't remember now I'd have to look for it but yeah. I, it was written and that was brought up but there was a whole question on how old that symbol has been and when it was really developed uh, mm -hmm. in modern usage. Michael, I, I, think, I think the term Volknut is a modern the term. term. It's like a modern Norwegian term. The actual yeah. symbology mm -hmm. is on is on a couple of, of, of early archaeological um, pieces, mm -hmm. including the Gotman stone, so it is quite an old. But the term, the name Volknut, we have no no record at all of that historically. Yeah, it's, it's a mysterious term. But the symbol is powerful, extremely yeah. powerful, isn't it? Uh, uh, Miran, I think uh, Frank is is is, is next. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, uh, did you want, uh, yes, uh, Conway, uh, did you want to say anything more? Otherwise, I'll, I'll open open the question for, for no, uh, I mean, Father Frank. The, um, the, the, the Scandinavian voices here just remind me of you know that i read somewhere and i completely forgot where that there is actually a um a depiction of somebody in yogic posture in scandinavia from fairly recently like a thousand years ago uh and so i i was wondering if anybody knows about that but oh is, is that if, on the uh, um Os yeah. osberg uh, sh ship ferry or one of the quite famous images of someone in a yogic position mm -hmm. one of the, one of the objects uh, uh, yeah I, uh, yeah that that is is remarkably uh, eastern looking very okay. meditative uh, and that's mm -hmm. that was found with some uh, other very uh, numinous looking things some sort of fruit as well but um, yeah. uh, perhaps I, I, I'll send you a, a, a picture of that but uh, okay. I'll well, the questions will be, be Father Frank, uh, Meron, I think, and uh, Stefan. Uh, uh, Frank, please go ahead. Okay, so um, the question I would like to ask our speaker, he did not touch on it, but um, I did a little bit of the research on his work online, with rich information and material. And um, I would like to ask him, um, if he believes in the um, theory, the idea that the Aryans invaded India, huh. invaded India. I, yeah. I, I'm not saying anything more because I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. interested in, in, yes. in answer to my question. <laughs> yes, you see, this is something I happen to be a specialist on. I've written several books about it. Good. So, no, I don't believe the Aryans invaded India. Good um and so that makes me very popular in india and very <laughs> shunned outside of it but i think it you know it's not a matter of chauvinism i think there are very good reasons to think so uh, first of all uh, the astronomical indications around the Rig Veda really point to the veda having been composed in india since like 3000 bc so this this idea of an invasion in 1500 bc is totally untenable uh, there's also archaeologically 
no sign of a discontinuity of an invasion in all the Harappan cities. So at some point there was an ecological disaster, but not an invasion. And then the contents of the Vedas themselves show that there is a movement of the Aryans from inside India, Ayodhya, the present Uttar Pradesh, east of Delhi, to the northwest and then to outside India. And so in the Vedas, they still remember from a few generations earlier, the uh, exit of the Druhyu tribe, which are probably our linguistic ancestors. And then in the, in the Vedas itself is described the battle of the 10 kings and the Varshagira battle, where the Anu tribe is being defeated and they also vacate India for the Northwest. And so then after that they become the Iranians and probably also the Armenians, the Greeks, the Albanians. And right. so for the Iranians at any rate, Afghanistan becomes their new center. That's where Zarathustra lives, for example. Um, but so uh, this is a fellow Shrikant Alagiri. He's on my, um, on my uh, PowerPoint. So you, you'll see him. Uh, Shrikant Alagiri has shown that the Vedas itself uh, describe the process of disintegration of Indo-European. So of course, they don't give all the, the linguistic details, but they, ex they explain what happened. And so all the geographical indications in the Rigveda clearly show a gradient from east to west, exactly the opposite from what you would expect in, in a, an Aryan invasion scenario. So are you saying that there were Aryans in India, but they were not the result of an invasion? Is that what you're saying? No, I say there was an emigration from India. And they, but so uh, these were Aryans or not? Well, I mean, that, that's what they have been called, yes. You know, when Max Müller used the word Aryan, he himself insisted yes. this exactly means speakers of Indo-European language. Linguistic. Nothing yes. else, yes. Linguistic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, just, just a brief note on, on, on that. Uh, have you kept up with the arguments currently on this issue, which you've used entirely genetic data? Yeah, well... Uh, you see, I'm not so impressed with the genetic data. Now, first of all, it's a science still in its infancy. So you see, I'll get, you know, contradicted mm -hmm. by new mm -hmm. discoveries and so on. But yeah. from the state of the science right now, first of all, the, um, the so-called Aryan gene, you know, a hundred years ago, they used to identify Aryan with a type of skull and you mm -hmm. had to have a backhead knob on your skull and so on. Um, so that's outdated, especially since 1945. But now they're back with this only at the genetic level. So, you know, some people say in all seriousness that the gene R1A1 indicates the Aryans. And so uh, this David Reich from uh, Harvard has shown or at any rate argued that there was an influx of that gene in India around 1500. BC. Now, first of all, it is very certain from other data that the Vedas are older than 1500 BC. So if that invasion took place, well, okay. But you see, invasions have taken place in India a lot. You know, the Scythians came, the Greeks came, the Huns came, the Tocharians came, mm -hmm. then the, the Arabs, the Turks, then there were peaceful immigrations of the Parsis, of the Syrian Christians, and so on. All these immigrants have left their genes in India. So you see, if you analyze the Indian population genetically, you will find plenty of immigrations. And so, yes, there are plenty of Central Asian immigrants in India, of course. But you see, none of those immigrant groups, not a single one, has imposed its language or has even preserved its language. They have all assimilated. Even the Muslims who came with a very strongly separatist ideology managed to maintain their religion, but lost their language. So the people who say, yeah, there was an Aryan invasion, what they have to explain is, okay, why were these Aryans so different from all these other later immigrants? Why were they suddenly so powerful that they could impose their language and their religion on a vastly larger population. 
Mm. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, th th thanks very much. Obviously, you clearly are keeping up uh, with the current thoughts on that, and, and uh, yeah, th I'm sure that was, uh, uh, it's a story that will be running for oh, yeah. many years. You know. Yeah, and one thing also about this gene R1A1 in the geneticists, and so they're very bad at linguistics. They're rather good at archaeology, but bad at history uh, and so on, but they're very good at exact sciences. And so once genetics came into play, now that's where they really contributed. And so they have also shown that this gene R1A1 actually originates in India. And the oldest samples are from India, even from the tribal population, supposedly the non-Aryans, and uh, that there's also far greater diversity Mm. Uh, within this gene in India than elsewhere, which also indicates origins. Um, so, uh, again, you see, I'm not even sure that there was an influx, but if there was an influx, then again, it's not good enough to explain the linguistic dead. Thanks very much. Good, good, good question, um, uh, Frank. Now, uh, I think it was Mehran first and then, and then Stefan. I have uh, just uh, some comments and remarks. Uh, first of all, many thanks for this nice and very informative presentation. Um, there are many, you know, um, uh, trajectories. I mean, you have, you have, you, you can, you can develop, you can use this Indian uh, heritage, cultural heritage, common cultural heritage of not only the Indo-European language family, but also, uh, you know, humanity as well. Uh, of course, I have one question, but I can leave my comments too. This is about this um, um, zodiac you mentioned before and this Indian, you know, signs and, well, and how, how central this zodiac is in uh, you know, the loops and the periodicity mm. of the history. Mm. Because and now I can, you know, make my, my remarks or comments. And w one is that, uh, okay, you can, you know, talk about uh, genetical similarities or, um, or differences. But one thing, and this was previously discussed by Mr. Giorgiani, uh, about you know that Indian gods became the divas or devils of Persian. Yeah, 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 of course so, that's happened. Yes, yeah. of course, of course. And you mentioned uh, millions of them, and you know, focused on thirty-three, which makes mm -hmm. me think of you know the Freemasonry and you know the, the mm -hmm. third mm -hmm. eye, which is very interesting. And that's that's an in interesting point because you know, routine, okay bridging between uh, Greece and India and that that way trying to, you know. Yeah, but you see uh, that. You know, uh, they get around Persia, which is, you know, so, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, you know, um, full of conflict. And that is why, you know, Iran has some problem with, with India, but we are so Indo-Iranians. But okay, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. we you want see. to, you know. Of course, really the Indian language. That. Of and course. the Iranian language are, of course. are quite and close then, to one another. Then, then take it. But they also of, fought one another. Yeah, of course, of course. But but the the relation with India is something uh, something else. It is not antagonistic, uh, as with Westerners, Abrahamic, uh, Aristoteles, mm -hmm. Alexander. They are arch enemies. There is no there is no um, no um, ground for any any, uh, you know, any peace or anything with Alexander, anything with Abraham, anything with Aristoteles, anything, nothing. Well, I don't know. War. You see. Yeah, yeah. I am <laughs> no, in constant no. war with that. Uh, uh, are. You see, this is a, okay. this is this a is, very this long is, this topic. Is, this has nothing with, to do with but this. You see, I'll make two points that you sort of suggest. Of course, no, 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 no problem. I have no problem first, with that. First this about is, Alexander. You see, Alexander, of course, was a conqueror. 
You meant to beat the may it burn in hell. In but, but okay, I I, I want to make some. No, no, no. The point is that may want let, was, let, let us speak. Uh, he was uh, very speak. respectful of religions. When he conquered Egypt, when he conquered Egypt. He Forget went him. all the way to Libya Forget to some favorite pilgrimage to the Egyptians. Okay. Please, let's speak okay. let, let, We are let not going speaker. to tell you about Alexander. My oh. remark is future arche ar archaeology, which means that where I, this is where I can find a very relevance to your very valuable talks. Because people talk about, okay, this Rig Veda, this Bhagavad Gita, and so on. They are so relevant to interpret the future. As you know, when, when you talk about, uh, I, I rather wanted you to men, maybe later talk about how uh, Indian culture influenced modern Western um, practices, which is far more in, uh, interesting. During the, before World War II, uh, during World War, Himmler, use this as some kind of precondition. Okay, we are going to, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, we are going, to, we do, we're doing some cosmic things. Yeah, and yeah. Oppenheimer, he did too. And after that, it was in a peaceful way. What does it mean? It means that when a Western mindset face huge forces, demonic forces, very violent forces, they go back to India. And when it wants to make peace, you know, yoga and gurus and things like that, or Kundalini and all those things uh, during the hippie era, San Francisco and so on, then you see India come back ag again. And this is my, my very point that India plays a very crucial role in wartime, extreme times and, uh, and uh, times where you want to uh, transcend to something else, into war, into peace, into another mindset, which is mm -hmm. extremely important, and also to interpret the future, because many philosophers, like mm -hmm. Giorgiani, he is talking about, you know, those people were, were, were there when aliens visited, the yeah, earth. Well. And, and it, this is about this was okay. something completely yeah. different. I, and yeah. that is uh, what I want to know. I, well, yeah. Alexander. We, don't, need, Thank we you. don't need aliens here. No, no. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, okay, there's one one point that you made <laughs> that I want to go into very briefly, namely the relation with the Iranians. You see, the devas or deities in India were turned into devils. Uh, by the Iranians, and conversely, the Asuras, the gods for the Iranians, were turned into devils in India. Though we have an early phase in the Rig Veda where Asuras, which is the Scandinavian Aesir, um, were gods. And um, so Varuna, the god of the heavenly order, is an Asura, and he happens to be the uh, you know, his, his, his form of address is Ahura Mazda in Iran. Yeah, that's Aruna. Um, okay, well, uh, you see, there was a war between them, which was not eternal. You know, in the Vedas, still in the, the younger books, you find a re renewed peace between them, which has to do also with the fact that then the border is clearly drawn. Namely, the mountains of Afghanistan are the border. So Afghanistan falls to the to the Iranians and India to the Indians. So good fences make good neighbors. But so before that, they had a lot of war. And what must have happened, and so the Battle of the Ten Kings, the most famous event in the Rig Veda, is a war between the Vedic tribe and the Iranians. Now, and you can see it, the names of the enemies are Iranian. Their religion is described. And so it says that they are without devas. They are without Indra because Indra has been demonized and they are without fire sacrifice. That really gives it away. You see, both have a fire sacrifice, but in India, they throw things into the fire. So through the smoke cloud, you know, it goes up to heaven. Whereas the Iranians think so highly of the fire 
that you're not allowed to pollute it by throwing things into it. Mm. That's also why in India they have cremation and in Iran they don't. Um, so that's all described. So it's very clear the enemies in the Battle of the Ten Kings are not the black aboriginals, as, as it is said still in many textbooks. They are the Iranians, who, Conrad, if anything, were whiter. Um, may, may, may I inflict something else? Yeah, yeah briefly, because Mitra, there are other people. Is that um, also a hostile a what? against, you know, the bull slaying Mitra? Is that also a hostile act against you know I, the Holy Cow? That yeah, that that I really have to have to study, but I don't know. Hmm. But one, you know, I was almost ready. <laughs> Namely, you see what must have happened in an earlier battle before the Rig Veda is again you see these two, the Vedic tribe, the Iranians fighting, worshiping the same god, the storm god Indra. But you see. If both sides worship him, well, he has to disappoint one of them. Okay, so clearly on some occasion, he gave the victory to the Vedic tribe and the defeat to the Iranian tribe. And so many religious people, when they don't get what they have prayed for, you know, they blame themselves. They say, oh, I haven't done the right sacrifices mm -hmm. or, you know, I've, I've looked at other women and you know, the, the commandments say this and that. And mm. So the Iranians were made of stronger stuff. They said to Indra, oh, if you don't want to give us victory, we reject you. And so from then on, Indra became demonized. Like, you know, the name Ahriman or Angra Manu, that means Indra. You see, Angra means the same as in English, angry. And Manu is one of the epithets of Indra, it means, means spirit. And so, you know, it becomes the evil spirit, quite literally. Uh, th th thanks very much. It's a, that's an important topic. Now, uh, Stefan, please. Uh, 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 before my making my main point, uh, I'd like to uh, ask if you think uh, that uh, the word var Varuna is uh, etymologically uh, uh, relative to uh, the Greek word for sky. Uranus, Uranus. Um, well, that's a much debated point, and most scholars nowadays say no, but I think they are related. And uh, you know, in in ancient Greek, in Ur Greek, uh, uh, there were some consonants uh, which fell off, and very often they were yeah. Uh, the Uranus is really Sigma, Uranus. Yeah. Or Digama. Uh, so it, yeah. it, it must have been Vuranos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it comes very close to that. Yes, I thought of that. And you you, you mentioned also uh, uh, Zeus Triphthalmos. Uh, where, uh, where do you find it? Do you remember? Uh, hardly. I mean, there's so much written about Greek mythology, and I've read so much that I really don't remember where I found it. I, but I, I, I know that you can find it on the internet because I've been looking <laughs> at pictures of it. Yeah. Th those I haven't found, by the way, but and, the name uh, was there, yes. Uh, uh, mm. As to blindness uh, of uh, Homer and uh, so on, uh, I'm, I come also to think of uh, Platon, who, uh, speaking of mathematics and uh, why mathematics uh, are, are useful, he says, uh, all all, all its usage for uh, application is is very secondary. The main point is that it opens an inner eye, which is uh, more important and precious than uh, thousands of physical eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, I, I'm thinking that um, physical blindness does not mean very much for somebody who has this inner sight. That might mm -hmm. be uh, something. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, may, there may be more connections. I mean, like even later, you know, uh, Plotinus, the, yeah, the, the fellow yeah. of Neoplatonism, that's yeah. entirely Vedanta. This yeah. theory of emanation yeah. rather mm -hmm. than creation, that's Vedanta. Yeah, he, yeah. he says, Ukan of Thalmos, Ilionidi, Ilioidis, Mige Genimenos. No eye can see uh, sun unless it is sunlight. Uh, well, but. Um, I disagree 
directly with you as to the uh, uh, Aryans in India and um, uh, modern genetics uh, and archaeo genetics is unassailable and uh, uh, you can't remove that. I don't know about the, the Indian geneticists, but, uh, but last year, well, in, in 2011 or 13, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Malta boy was found uh, and that carried the, uh, the uh, uh, original ancestry, which came from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Northern Siberia, Verkhoyansk uh, uh, mountain range, uh, uh, in, um, which, which was free of ice uh, uh, due to uh, its ring formed uh, uh, mountains, uh, which protected it. And, uh, uh, that Malta and but last year a, a tooth was found in the same area where many artifacts, uh, uh, lots of artifacts uh, about um, uh, the same age were uh, have been ha had been found already about uh, 2002 or three uh, and now they found a tooth and they analyzed it genetically. And it carries that, uh, uh, and it's not just a, a, a uh, gene; it's haplogroup R N A N uh, R one A one, and, and it is not just that; it, it's it's lots of things. No, no, but of course it's present in Siberia, and so what these Indian geneticists have shown is that the R one A one gene left from India and went oh. in two directions: one was Eastern Europe, and the other was Tuva, which is more or less the Altai Mountains in Siberia. Excuse me, that and, is, but, but that, that is And not... in fact, I've just recently heard a lecture by David Anthony, who is the uh, brain at the moment behind the Aryan invasion theory, who admits that there is no trace of a migration from Eastern Europe, which according to him is the, the homeland, uh, to this Tuva in Siberia, whereas right. Both of them are connected to India. No, no, it, it was not to Siberia. From Siberia, they came down to uh, Yamnaya area, which is yeah, the, yeah. Steps, the steps uh, of southern Russia and Ukraine, north of Caucasus. Uh, it, it, the, the original place was uh, <laughs> very high up uh, in northeastern Siberia, and they migrated from there. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, they they came down to uh, Yamnaya, uh, where mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, from Yamnaya th they moved, and very recently yeah, yeah. actually okay. they made also an uh, an analysis of uh, Greek archaeogenetics from northern Greece, and they found uh, in some skeletons about fifty to sixty percent from that Yamnaya area. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. but you see, we largely agree. You see the point. The point that is being made here, and I'll explain to everyone. You see, the Yamna culture or pit grave culture uh, yeah. is located between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Yes. And so, when you look at it from Europe, the Indo-European immigration took place from there. That's where they came from. That's true. And it was a very sensational immigration because it. Archaeologically, we find new pottery types, new habitation, new grave types, and so on. It's a complete revolution. And even genetically, we find that in the male line, most of the uh, native population disappears, not in the female line. So we have a classical scenario of the men being killed in the battlefield and the women being taken as sex slaves or something to that effect. And um, so it was not such a nice story, but at any rate, for historians, it's a great story in the sense that it's amply documented. You see, both genetics and archaeology massively show an invasion at the time. Now that precisely is what doesn't happen in India. In India, you have no sign of this. But you see where we entirely agree is where you say this pit grave or Yamna culture yeah. Was not was not really the homeland in the sense that it was only a secondary homeland. Yes, it I was agree. already an area of settlement from people coming from farther east. There we entirely agree. 
Oh, well, I, I, I think uh, they, they came from northeast. I, I don't think we will. Uh, yeah, th 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 this will be a big stop. But it'd be, I'd like to ask uh, people that haven't spoken uh, to to make some comments. And uh, uh, um, Conrad's been very generous with his time. So, uh, but I don't wish to uh, overstretch it. You know, I think we, we, we've been over two hours. So I, you know, yeah. uh, Linda, Linda, you, yeah, please, uh, if you could unmute. Yeah. One, one first thing it was just a comment. I have got a question, but one was a comment. Um, you talked about Gahulan. There's no, to my knowledge, there's no evidence of Gahulan having one eye. It's mentioned in some of the um, myths that he had seven pupils in each eye, which is interesting going back to what Stefan's just been saying. Mm. Um, and that at one point he closed an eye so he, so he could see better, but not that he had one eye. But his grandfather was Balor, and Balor was a one-eyed giant. He had a big eye. Oh yeah. In the center of his forehead. Uh, whose so, grandfather was he? Uh, that's Kahuna's grandfather. Um, he, uh, you know, no, hang on. It was his grandson. No, Luke. It's his great grandfather. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So Balor's grandson was Luke, uh, who killed him, um, and it was his son. So it's his great grandfather. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, I didn't know the story so that, at all. Yes, Thanks the a was a one-eyed giant. But the other thing I just wanted to ask was, I was going back to the first part of your talk, um, as in the, the, the ICCS and maybe the future of it and what they're doing with the Hindus and the Druids, because um, I attended the last, the, the, the last one and I've been invited to go to the one Druid ones. I was invited one last year to speak as the heathen because it's the only Druid, like the heathen, <laughs> the heathen, as the one Dru Druids are there. Um, but I found at the last one, it was not just, was just very Druid bias, but it was, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem to progress any uh, in terms of it's meant to be a, a, an interdisciplinary group who are working together on multi- of, Really, I entirely it, it, agree. And, and then all these dis discussions came up a lot about animism, very nothing about polytheism. There was no discussions on polytheism. The Druids there were very speaking very much from like the Obod, the, 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 the Druid yeah, yeah. perspective. And they were also the big difference between the Hindus and the, the ones that attended was that a lot of the Hindu students were young people and they were talking about a living religion that has passed down mm -hmm. to their families and how they're be, and you said it was students but it was lots of young people and yep. then the druids were all older but also they were saying that they don't have many young people coming into into because they were speaking as pagans not just as yep. druids and which isn't true there aren't many young people because if you look at heathenry now particularly within within, within the british isles there's a lot of young people they might not stick with it and they might not have a fully rounded mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. of of the religion, but there are a lot of young people within heathenry. Um, yeah. So I, well, I just think it was really unbalanced. They having yeah. Jewish, having yeah, 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 yeah. I I agree. This is this organization is is very much still in its infancy, and also, you see, I can say about the Hindus that they know very little about the outside world, mm -hmm. even when they move to America, they still don't know. Um, it's like um, you see, Al Biruni a Persian scientist living in India in about the year 1000 uh, said that Hindus think that there is nothing like their country, you know, that, uh, you know, nothing like their culture and their goals and so on. At that time, India was a superpower. And so like, for instance, you see in, in Arabic, they have a girl's name, Hind, which means India. And so typical for girls' names is that they're named after treasure, after something precious. And so India at that time was like the center of science and arts and so on, to which the Arabs in their little desert looked up to, right? So India at that time was a superpower. Now, what do you see in America today? Americans don't know anything about the outside world. And there are even jokes about that. And so, you know, <laughs> Indians still have that. And even though they've been beaten badly in the Middle Ages and so on, they have developed a sort of inferiority complex. But deep down, they also still have that superiority complex. And so 
they are not very curious about the outside world. They could have learned a lot more than they have by now. But so these are the problems we face, you know, it's time to work on all that. Mm -hmm. um, as to your point that you don't see any progress. Now you see having followed this movement for some years, uh, that's what I see indeed as the great problem. You know, mm -hmm. first they made contact with others and that's all very nice. But, you know, you can't keep on being chummy, you know. Yeah. Now that we found love, what <laughs> are we going to do with it? <laughs> so that's something to work on. I, I don't have the answer yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that, 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 that is very true. Um, you need uh, some humans in there to stir up the pot, Ron. They just, just drew it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're nice people, but... but mm, very uh, nice. it, as, as you, you spoke about to comrades, sometimes th this means actually engaging with issues that maybe aren't so uh, so pleasant to engage in, and there will be real disagreements yeah. on things, and that, that, that that's healthy, really. That is a healthy thing. Uh, so, um, Danielle, you, you don't you don't have a question or a comment. Uh, I mean, I, I like to try and uh, have a contribution from everyone because it, it's these sort of small meetings. It, it's like we're in a room. And we're around the table, and it, it, it's nice to. Uh, you, uh, you, you don't have any anything to anything to ask. Sometimes when people are silent and they're forced to ask a question, it can often be a really good one. I just have to say that I'm really pleased of this meeting because I've learned a lot. But you people are in another level. I'm just <laughs> beginning, and um, and you know. To, so sometimes the, the, the question from someone that is not familiar with a topic can be very, very good. And it's mm -hmm. a quite, yeah, uh, I, I, I think. But anyway, uh, um, Ma Ma Michael, um, please, I'm sure you will be able to uh, have a comment or a question. Well, I'll stay only a comment because, yes, I'm out of my depth as well. Um, but if you really want to comment, I'll just throw in a fun fact or a comment um, about sacrifice. You mentioned thing about human sacrifice and in my beloved Tintin, from which you can find so much in Explorers from the Moon, the traitor, Wolf, uh, sacrifices himself by throwing himself out of the spaceship so that Tintin and Haddock can arrive safely back at Earth, because otherwise there wouldn't be enough oxygen. And I think that, and, and redeems himself. And it's almost, oh, I can, actually my heart, right. but it's almost religious. Yeah. And redeems yeah. himself. And that is an interesting aspect of sacrifice, perhaps, that uh, sometimes yeah. through sacrifice, you actually redeem yourself or your sins, you know, like the hero who sacrifices himself yeah. for his comrades and redeems himself for something that he did wrong in mm -hmm. his life. Oh, just, right. that, that was a fun fact to throw in anyway. Well, that, that, that is, is a very useful... Sorry, 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 comrade, did you want to... Which story uh, was that? Explorer, explorers on the moon, which is in Tintin, 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 or Shaded Tintin. That's my favourite Tintin story, the what the moon. The, oh, is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, is it really? Oh, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think that is a, a, another reason why we should sure have a, a, a meeting of our, our literary circle uh, looking at Tintin. I think it's uh, more in that than you know should be given attention. But oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I absolutely I agree with you, Michael. Uh, sacrifice is, I think, the key metaphor. Really, it's a very important one for paganism. And, and the bloke that we have, it's about offering and and, and giving things. Uh, uh, and, and that's yeah. That, 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 that is something. See, that, well, sacrifice, perhaps one could say, has an extremely dark and an extremely light side because sacrifice, when you're unwilling and somebody is just throwing you into a mouth, as with Moloch, or do you haven't agreed to it or something, is something totally different than sacrificing, it, giving it, yourself self -sacrifice. willingly, self-sacrifice, if you like. So yeah. it's an interesting subject, I, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. And when when I'm uh, at, at the altar, when we're making offerings uh, at a bloke, I always obviously uh, repeat. The, the verses in Halvamol about Lord Odin saying that he is sacrificing himself to himself, mm. which is one of the most mysterious and powerful uh, things I can think of said in, in a religious text, which I still don't properly understand, but feel that's correct. Um, um, so I, I just asked, uh, uh, Jean, hello, I've not seen you before. Uh, I don't know whether you can hear us, but do, do you have anything to, to say at all? Uh, uh, please unmute if you do. 
Um, I, I don't really. I, I came late in. Um... Well, very welcome. No, nothing wrong with that. I'm sure you had other things to do before. Uh, but good to I have you. I came quite late, so I came along soon because. Any, any thoughts or, or, or comments, I've questions? Really to, to say. I've just been sitting listening, basically. Oh, well, very nice to have you. Uh, for, for, for very nice to. Uh, as I said, uh, Conrad, you've been uh, very good with your time and energy, so I, I want to get close soon. Uh, Mehran, did you have a short question or comment? To... Yeah, I hope it is relevant and uh, contributive. One question about Kali and Kali Shakti. And what's the point with, you know, chopping off the head of the devil? Who is that devil? Who is Kali? Because Kali Shakti, among you know, young philosophers, mm -hmm. is very relevant. It's about transcendence. It's about self-sacrifice. I mean, yeah. what is Michael talking about? But it's about you know an individualistic thing. But I think Kali will play a very, uh, you know, it, it, she has a, a, a great function, and you know, riding down the tiger. This is you know occupying my mind so much and I, I hope you can you know help me how to understand Kali and how to understand yeah. Kali and the devil she's you know dealing with thank you yeah maybe I don't know enough about that that's uh, so it's um, it's a goddess in the sense of it's it's female energy it's Shakti Shakti which means energy so you have the symbolism of the male as consciousness and the female as matter energy uh, so Shiva is the consciousness, Shakti is the rest. Um, and so that comes in different forms. You see, uh, consciousness is one. Like you can see, for instance, very simple. You know, you can only concentrate on one thing at the same time. If you multitask, it does not mean your attention is directed to several things at the same time. No, your direction flip-flops between one attention center and another. Uh, so consciousness is one, whereas nature is many. And so we all partake of nature, we give to nature constantly and we, you know, take from nature. Uh, but so there is one nature, but you see this nature is differentiated. And so it has these three qualities, which can of course be combined and become more complex than three, but, you know, analyzable as ultimately three. Um, so you have the white goddess, the, the, the red goddess, and the black goddess, Kali. Kali means, it's an interesting word, um, so folk etymology, but correct etymology, is that um, Kali means the black one. Mm -hmm. The E is the female ending, and so the, the root Kala means black. Um, and... Um, but the real meaning is another word, Kala. Perhaps ultimately the two words are related, but there is another word, Kala, which means time. And so Kali means Mrs. Time. But what time? You see, Kali specifically means hour of death. So it means Mrs. Hour of Death. And so you know, she cuts off the heads of everyone because everyone dies at some point. And so, so she collects, you know, this, this string of heads because that's what, you know, that's what time but does. But where are all, the, all the, those, you know, dead reasons called men? Hmm? How come? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's the symbolism. Ah, she um, only kills men. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there's a secret to that. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, misoandry or something. <laughs> That's why she's so relevant. She's, you know, the goddess of our time. Uh -huh. Menadic. You're done. Well, you see, that I don't think. I mean, nowadays there are many, like in the pagan movement, there are very many who emphasize goddesses, who emphasize Isis in Egypt and mm. Athena in Greece and so on. That's nice. Um, but you see, at a deep level, I would say it's also irrelevant because that's just the symbolism, that's just a manner of speaking. I mean, these personifications, these gods are, you know, are uh, 
a simple, uh, a childlike expression of what could be seen in a more abstract manner. You know, it's like, it's like in the zodiac, you see the sign areas has this symbol of a ram, you know, attacking. But if we lived in a world where there were no sheep, no rams, you know, or for instance, in a hundred years, maybe they're all exterminated, who knows, then that symbol wouldn't make sense. And you would have to find another symbol, but that's no matter because the symbol is only a symbol, is a way of expressing something, an idea which exists in the abstract, namely areas is the sign of beginnings, of pioneers, of freedom. Um, and so that is expressed with this symbol, maybe another symbol could be found. Like you can see the Chinese zodiac has the same origin as the Babylonian zodiac, but the symbols have changed a bit. They're still a bit recognizable, partly not. But so similarly, gods and goddesses are ways of expressing something. And I think ultimately they're not that important. And so talk about like, what, you know, what they call theology as opposed to theology, you know, that's, I, I understand where that comes from, but you know, if you're really serious about religion, that's not so important. In the Mahabharata, um, you know, I mean, to give an example of how women re-evaluate their own importance in the old pagan epics, you know, there is a nun uh, um, in, in Sanskrit uh, called Sulabha and so you see women say oh yeah look you know the women were so important in the Mahabharata yeah that's true but why is she important you see she's a great yogini and she does some strong stuff um, she visits the city of King Janaka and, you know, Janaka says, well, you know, tonight you're going to, you know, you're welcome to sleep here. You, you go find in the palace or in the city a place where you want to stay the night, there you can stay. And so by nightfall, she comes back to the king and she says, well, I've been looking around, I can't find a place to stay. Ah, well then, and then they come to an agreement, she's going to stay in a very particular place, namely inside the head of King Janaka. <laughs> and so pop, she falls in, and so she stays there the night, and the next morning she leaves again. Now, interestingly, um, they have a debate. You see this, this non Sulabha and King Janaka, they have a debate over the question of the gender of the self. And so she wins the debate with the position that the self is not gendered. So the self is not feminine, it's not masculine. You know, you could say as a symbolic way of saying that the self means consciousness is male and nature is female, but that's really only a manner of speaking. The self is not gendered, you see. The self is not black or white, the self is not big or small, the self is not hot or cold. And so it's also not male or female. Is see, that the self part of a precisely Kali is the emptiness, is the yeah. absence of, of properties, of qualities. So it's neither male nor female. What does it mean when she chop up her own head? Uh, that's not it, Kali. She kills herself too. Kali, Kali, you know, chops everybody's head off. But there is another goddess who chops off her own head. That's China Mastha. Now that I am uh -huh. not really sure what that means. That's in the whole Kundalini lore. That's a bit, a bit mm. on the side. Um, but I suppose it means you have the same imagery in Taoism in China, that you have to chop your own off your own head, which means nothing violent. There's another expression in this Taoist writing, the Tao Te Ching, that says um, you have to empty your head and fill your belly. Now, some people say, oh yeah, this means a totalitarian system where the people are kept dumb, you know, with, you know, bread and, and in games to fill their belly, but, you know, keep their mind empty. No, no, that's not the meaning at all. It's a meditational practice where you empty the head, you know, your mind becomes silent and your belly means your energy center. 
So like in Zen Buddhism, you know, you breathe to the place in the lower mm -hmm. belly. And so you concentrate on that. And so your, your, your mind becomes empty, mm -hmm. right? So that's one of the more peaceful meanings of chopping off your own head. Thank you. I think now we will uh, come to an end. Uh, it, it was particularly interesting what you said, and just to make uh, to mention the sad death of uh, uh, Nick Nick Allen with uh, really interesting work about the origins of, of yoga. Yeah, which, yeah that, that 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 is sad. Uh, what one thing I'd like you to sort of promise to do if you come to London. Please get in touch, and uh, several of us yeah, we yeah. can meet in a nice place and uh, certainly ha have a have a have a civilized no, no. evening. You know, this gives uh, me an extra reason to come to London. That that, wow. that would be very nice. That would be very nice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, you you walked uh, upon sensitive uh, issues on upon the eggshells with great style and dignity, and uh, yeah, you've really really fed us a feast of uh, of facts that that will. Uh, be fruitful so i'm very grateful for that and, and, and for the presentation now i will say a few more words in old norse blow out the candle and we can wish one another goodbye mm -hmm. blessed gods of our peoples and lands at evening shall one praise the day and at night shall one praise the evening we offer thanks for what we've profited by and for what we found pleasure in. Sigur either, sigur either, sigur os, sigur os, quida either, quida either, quida os, quida os. Hello, Dean. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for, for, for staying. Thanks, comrade, for your time. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Linda. Michael in London, Michael in Cologne. Daniel in uh, Mexico, good to have you, Mehran in Sweden, and uh, Gina, I think you, you may, may, may be in Scotland, I hope, please come again to another uh, moot, however late, uh, it, it's always good to have people, so good night everyone, yeah, have, a, have, you, a, a, have a nice yeah, evening, bye bye, bye bye. Thank you Will. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.